Hey pals, do you want to find out how you can get more Go With The Heat? Maybe even get a business card and a skinny tie? Find all this and more on our Patreon, patreon.com slash go with the heat. We'd love to get your support. Even for as little as $1 a month, you can show your support for this little old indie podcast. Now enough of me, let's turn on that music. Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week, we're finally there. Season 4, Episode 1, titled Contempt of Court. It originally premiered on September 25th, 1987. It is written by Peter McCabe. Now, I have a theory here. Not knowing anything else that happens, we're going to find out throughout this season. But Peter McCabe... This is his first Miami Vice episode he wrote. He's got three more coming. I'm going to take a wild guess here and say that I'm going to say that a lot in season four, that this is the first episode they've written and that Dick Wolf turned over the entire writing crew between seasons three and four, which would also explain why episodes got weird in season four (laughs) and why we jumped the shark in season four (laughs) it makes sense that we got a new bunch of writers in the writer's room obviously we've just started in season four and i can already see some of the changes tubbs has a fantastic beard uh (laughs) crockett looks like husky david spade Right out of the gate, you're right, Sean. There's a lot of changes. And one is obviously the way the men look. We haven't seen the ladies. We saw Stan briefly twice. He looks the same. (laughs) (laughs) Just saying. He hasn't changed. (laughs) (laughs) There's no change to the opening credits. There's a change to the end credits, though. There's a couple new scenes in the end credits. Not very excited about that. (laughs) Horsies in the the end credits. (laughs) But that beard melissa oh that beard is so nice (laughs) i love the tubs beard i think that i know this is gonna be it's controversial but i think the tubs looks really good with the beard and crockett looks really bad with the big hair and the big (laughs) shoulder pads so this season is a hard season for crockett his look takes a big big (laughs) kick on this one (laughs) all i know is with that hair that crockett he better be tipping his hairdresser very good yeah i mean a lot of work going into that from behind (laughs) there's one scene where he's looking out the window from behind he's got some big shoulder pads he's got that hair he looks like a middle-aged woman his uh, pants are also yeah. getting puffier. Yes, yeah, so they're getting puffier. And then he's wearing like like tank tops with print on them underneath. Like, the, I don't know, V-neck tank tops with print on them <laughs> underneath his jacket with his big puffy jacket, too. What's going on? This is not what's the, fashion. <laughs> what's with the bright salmon shirt under the white suit? I don't know. And his Crockett's fashion has always mystified me throughout the run of the show so far. Because Tubbs always looks clean. He's got a suit that fits him really nice. He always looks like really professional. Where everyone else's dress throughout the show is big, flamboyant, wildly different. You know, they, they it's way out there. And Tubbs is always very clean cut. The only one that is the same is Castillo or Switek, who just wears a Hawaiian shirt every day. Hey, not true. Sometimes Castillo wears a little bit of a wider tie. No, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, but I mean, in this episode, it looks like he's actually dressed for court. Crockett looks like he's going to a uh, George Michael lookalike contest. <laughs> he could win that, actually, in that suit. <laughs> Directed for Give Us Our Dits. He also has a couple more, or one more episode coming. Before we get started, can check in and see what's going on in each other's lives. Guys, it's been quite a while since we've been on an official episode of Go With The Heat for an episode of Miami Vice. And in that time, a huge announcement has been hitting the airwaves and has taken over whenever football is on ABC. And Melissa, you have been in on the ground floor of this, scouring the internet and <laughs> any words mentioned of this. And I the have exciting news is that Roseanne is coming back for a limited, I think, I'm not sure how many episodes. I think it's only like six or seven episodes and it's coming back for just just the one one season but the big thing is everybody that's a that's like i know this is gonna sound bad but everyone that's alive to be back on the show is gonna be back on the show everyone. some people that have passed away bad. i know some people have passed away but everyone else is going coming back and going to be back in and i have heard a rumor i'm not sure if it's true but they're bringing both becky's back and that old becky is going to be becky and new Becky's going to be her daughter, <laughs> which I love. I hope that's true. Uh, I'm dying to know. But yes. I was going to ask you how, how the two Becky's thing was going to work. I mean, that just makes it even more interesting because that means that 
old Becky. She must have seen some hard times to be able to pull <laughs> off new Becky's mom. I know because also in the show, Darlene's kids are tw- her twins are uh, were born first, and they're only teenagers in this. This this they're like thirteen or fourteen. So it, it's just it's a total play on like, hey, we're just gonna stick this person in here, and people and the fans are gonna of the show are just gonna like it because it's her. Mm-hmm. And they make jokes about, well, you know, of course, her being... of course, the biggest change is that John Goodman, Dan, isn't going to be dead, which he should be in the beginning. Exactly. Of this, and apparently uh... with that, they're just going to ignore that and just not even bring it up. I'm sure they'll make jokes like nods about it in, in the episodes and stuff, but it will not be it will never be said like how he survived. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, what what bugs me is we've gotten on this trend where we we we've run out of ideas and we're reinventing 80s sitcoms and even 90s sitcoms too except we're just throwing the rules out they brought back will and grace they just completely threw out how it ended and, and just started over like the show never stopped you know it, it's the same thing with roseanne we're throwing out the fact that dan died yeah but i would say that the way that the roseanne ended versus the way that will and grace ended was like controversial and and the cast of friend of, of, of roseanne has always said they didn't like how it ended and that they regret like that they didn't go further and finish it because the fans didn't like it. I have read a bunch of stuff on it and I have listened to a bunch of interviews like with John Goodman and stuff. And he said he's like the fans didn't get the ending that they wanted. And it's always been like a regret of mine that because apparently a part of it was that he didn't want to be on the show anymore. He was pushing hard to get out of it. He wanted to go do movies and stuff, which he had. A, he has a great career. He so. made King Ralph. Yeah. What more do people <laughs> want? Excuse me, yeah. he made the big Lebowski. Forget about King Ralph. No. Um, yeah, so so that's part of it. That where you're right. Like with the whole Will and Grace thing, like throwing it out. I don't know. I don't like Will and Grace, and I would never watch. So I don't know what the ending was. But I do know with Roseanne, people were not happy with the ending. So this is not. And this is. I would never watch like Fuller House or anything like that. So I just feel like this is. It's okay because it's the original cast. I'll wrap up with the final two points here from my perspective. One, I know they're touching stuff from the '80s. If they touch a never-ending story, I'm gonna fucking hurt somebody. Oh yeah, I'm I know. Fucking I'll hurt cut somebody. You. <laughs> You're fucking bad. <laughs> you do not touch that movie. Two, with how Roseanne's life was after the show Roseanne ended, I am so surprised that the entire cast was like, "Yeah, we want to come back." I thought for sure it was like bad terms, and she got crazy, and everyone. No, it's still a tight cast. Like they still all love each other. Yeah, but they're even, all willing to come back. Yeah, even Artie so. wants to come back. He needs money too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i know i don't think he's coming back <laughs> well speaking of remakes based on this episode of miami vice it sure feels like law and order is a ripoff of miami vice because this was a law and order episode of vice if i've ever seen one let's go talk about this episode <laughs> So when we start off the episode, we're in a very fancy boardroom, lots of people working, very black suit. They're not working. <laughs> no, they're not actually doing anything. There's a lot of people for a boardroom, too, by the way. No, you know, and it, it, just sitting around eating Chinese food. So it must be like a Monday. Uh, um, <laughs> and they're all just sitting quietly and reading their fortunes, which apparently um, <laughs> Frank's must not have been too good. <laughs> Yeah, because then the duo come busting in. They got a warrant. They're going to come arrest Stanley Tucci, which John's going to get to here in a minute, who's playing Mosca, the mobster. And they're there to serve their warrant and pick him and arrest him. The staff at the business is pleading with him that he has to wait. But there's Crockett's not going to take no for an answer. And this is when we first see Crockett's hair, the tub's beard, and how fantastic the hair is going to be in season four <laughs> <laughs> well Mosca. the duo just needs to wait because mosca is busy burning money and that i mean that's <laughs> that's way more important than anything they've got to do to tell. <laughs> this whole scene is very strange because like like he knew that they were coming he signals to his lawyer to go ahead and let them in they talk for a few minutes he lights that paper on fire and I don't even know why they let him do that. Like, what if he's burning evidence? Yeah, I don't know what is going on. <laughs> <laughs> See, I thought that was like money. It looked like it looked like Monopoly money to me. So I thought like, oh, well, he's burning money while he's talking to the cops. And he why has this not? weird attitude throughout the entire episode, too. He's Mr. Funny Man. Yeah, he seems to be extremely relaxed throughout this whole process. In fact, not just relaxed, but hungry. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I know. He's hungry everywhere he goes. At the next scene, when they go to the courthouse and they're at the bail hearing, he's he opens up a box of chocolates and like, passes them around the, the entire courthouse. Yes. The entire courthouse, like, hell yeah. Well, even the judge is like, hey. like I know. And the yeah, judge doesn't the stop crowd. it. Like... <laughs> Frank can't be bothered by your court date. It's snack time, and people want their chocolate-covered cherries. <laughs> <laughs> the state is able to successfully have his bail set at a million dollars to not let him out, like, just free but be, be, before the trial starts. And so things are kind of looking against Mosca at this point, even though he looks like he's really confident in court. His lawyer does it, as you find out throughout the rest of the episode, his lawyer isn't so confident. But Moscow's got this real arrogant attitude throughout the entire case and throughout this entire episode. Oh, yeah. It's like he's, he, as soon as the arraignment is over, he's back to business. It's back to money burning. And uh, uh, it's probably Tuesday at this point. So probably <laughs> Taco Tuesday, I would think, for lunch. <laughs> On his way out of the courtroom, he stops at the duo and tells him, hey, next time, make an appointment. And then we head to the opening credits. Now, before we move on, this we can cover both of our big guest stars that happened in this episode. I mentioned Stanley Tucci already, but there is another one that was in that courthouse. Yeah, so, of course, Stanley Tucci playing Frank Mosca in this episode and will return as Frank in the episode Blood and Roses. We already saw Stanley Tucci. We met Stanley Tucci in season three. Episode 9, Baby Blues, where he played it, uh, Stephen DeMarco. Stephen wanted that to episode. talk, and then he didn't want to talk when he found out Crockett shot all those babies. He didn't shoot those babies. <laughs> <laughs> Just to recap, Stanley Tucci, you you might know him from, the, from movies like The Pelican Brief, Road to Perdition, or The Hunger Games. But let's talk about our other guest star, Philip Baker Hall who plays Judge Delaporte, which honestly doesn't look like a Judge Delaporte, but okay. <laughs> yeah, the name was throwing me off, too. I was like, um, what? What judge are they going to go see? <laughs> He's actually been in a ton of stuff. So I'm just going to highlight a few of the movies and TV that he's been in, but ju but he he's just one of those actors that's in like every third movie. He was in Ghostbusters 2, he was in Midnight Run, Hard 8, Air Force One. He was in all three of the Rush Hour movies. He was in Boogie Nights. Damn, he's uh, got um, a wide you know, range. And then, I mean, also clearly works with P.T. Anderson. Yeah, don't you remember him in Heart 8? I was like, yes. Mm -hmm. Not afraid of nudity. <laughs> <laughs> so then on the TV side, early roles included The Waltons, Family Ties, a slightly more recent Third Rock from the Sun. He was even in an episode of Seinfeld. Damn, damn. Well, he has a pretty prominent role in this episode, even though he doesn't say anything. He's great at furrowing his brow. <laughs> looking bored, <laughs> generally not amused with people's actions, you know, acting. <laughs> you know. <laughs> when we come back from the opening credits, we're at the precinct, the duo will come in, they have all the surveillance records, they're monitoring everything. So this is, we get the feel that they've been monitoring Mosca for a long time. Also, as dad says twice that Mosca's going to go after witnesses and then they talk some more and then dad says they're going to go after witnesses like he ain't listening to nothing else <laughs> and I'm going to put Crockett and Tubbs <laughs> in charge of making sure that the witnesses are safe so basically all witnesses are going to die pretty much <laughs> yes starting to get a little tired again I, I think it needs to be snack time again how about ice cream this time <laughs> We go to the street and Mosca's walking down the street with his lawyer and a car following them with his bodyguards nearby. So who knows why they're not in the car, why they need to walk. And he's treating his lawyer to some ice bars. Yes, we eat Fancy, again. Like, there must be yogurt. I bet you he gets good. Yeah, I guess you get the good ice cream bars. The frozen yogurt bars. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Not Low the, fat. <laughs> <laughs> not the ones that come in the paper bag. <laughs> actual plastic on them yes, that way they don't yes. stick to it Mosca takes care of his people uh -huh. <laughs> his lawyer is begging that he not do anything stupid and Mosca says I'm gonna figure out who fingered me which I really hope you do <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you should know that <laughs> I really hope you I'll tell you this, it'll be his last snack time. <laughs> <laughs> Mosca's just saying, I'm going to take care of it. 
and we all know what that means. He's going to muscle, intimidate, and kill all the witnesses, potential witnesses that it could be, which happens really fast because in the very next scene, we head over to someone who's named Jimmy. Of course, his name is Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy the pizza guy. No, I'm just <laughs> the leaning tower maker. <laughs> I'm pretty sure he made a comment in the last scene about how he learned to walk when talking business from Jimmy. So now we're here visiting Jimmy, yes. who taught him everything he knows. Yeah, and Jimmy says... I haven't talked to any feds, and Mosca's like, bullshit, please tell me what you told the feds, because I know you're one of the people that talked. And Jimmy says, no, I heard something about some other guy, some guy with a last name with an F, Bugatti, or I can't remember yeah, what his yeah, name Fugetti is. Yeah, Bugatti or something like that. Yeah. He's like, but it's not me. I'm loyal. I wouldn't do anything like this. And then suddenly, two bodyguards appear behind Mosca. And one of them is just fantastic. And he's in this entire thing. He wears these big sunglasses. He's got this big square uh -huh. face. Yeah, just call him Big Guns or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember seeing him at uh, at one of the court scenes and seeing him in the back and thinking like, oh, man, look, Brett, man, Brett the Hitman Hart's here. <laughs> <laughs> those canadians get around he's not wearing a shirt <laughs> yeah i feel like you need to have sleeves to enter in a court i feel like that's a, we'll that's a, that. that's mandatory but whatever you know we'll, we'll, we'll get <laughs> to that the bodyguard hands mosca a gun he turns and shoots and kills jimmy immediately leaves from there heads over to jack's and he goes and talks to jack who is extremely sweaty too like he looked like he went swimming in that water that's outside of his little <laughs> warehouse he's, he's a hard-working right man he's sweating <laughs> and mosca is telling rivers that his boys need to take care of stuff in miami so basically mosca is not going to be doing any work for the near future and he needs rivers to make sure that his boys are miami are taking care of stuff. Now we head back over to the courthouse. Sunny is talking to the state attorney. Her name is Alice. Her whole case rides on Sunny's informant. So it is really important that he stays alive. And then also... Don't worry. Crockett's keeping an eye on him. <laughs> hey, I gotta say it right now. We're, we're going to have problems if you guys don't agree that Crockett did what he was supposed to do. <laughs> hey. like, for once, we can argue life, that he right didn't now. Bang someone. He didn't bang the wrong person. He wasn't not paying attention to the witness. He did what he was supposed to do. I'm just saying it right now. I'm putting it out there. Hey, for all that time, he was locked I, up in prison. I'm just going to oh, put it. Because he did what he was supposed to do. <laughs> I'm just going to put it out right now, then, that he just said he's keeping an eye on him. Aside from the very next scene in which he visits him on the beach, he well, does he is, not. He is not in the same room with the witness. <laughs> he is not in the same room with the witness until he is murdered. Uh, he's on the beach with him. How is that not next to him, taking care of him? <laughs> After the beach, he go back and see him again. <laughs> hey, I don't know because how many witnesses have you taken care of, John? <laughs> I think none. So I don't think you know how to do it. Hey, hey, just uh, saying, up to I don't date, think you know how never to lost a witness. <laughs> I have never lost a witness. True. The scene ends at the courthouse where she's saying the judge is going to try and compel you to reveal who your informant is. And he's like, yeah, I know. And if I don't, I go to jail. Then we head over to the beach. And that's when Sonny comes running out of left field, gets an interception and tries to break it. <laughs> for a touchdown but river's kids like nah -uh, nah -uh, old no no because i'm going to college for this <laughs> and now we see why sunny never made it to the nfl exactly <laughs> <laughs> now rivers and crockett's informant as we see here is jack the person that mosca already went and talked to and told him he needs to take care of business in miami so this is obviously a very trusted person in the Mosca organization. Uh, also, Frank is going to be very surprised at who his informant is. Shocked. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And this continues the, co uh, the conversation that was happening at the courthouse, too, where Jack is refusing witness protection because his son has an opportunity to go play college football. Well, I mean, well, you don't you want your son alive? Like, <laughs> Well, his son be a contender. 
you know? <laughs> yeah. So he's, he's going to hang around. So, and then he gives his son, he tells his son, because I, I, I think he sees the writing on the wall, what could happen. Tells his son, hey, if anything happens to me, trust Sonny, <laughs> unless he's the guy that gets me killed. <laughs> Which is just as likely at this point. <laughs> well, but it's not. <laughs> no, no, Tubbs gets ready for this one. Yeah, <laughs> that would be Tubbs. <laughs> at the courthouse, they're having another hearing. The judge is talking to the lawyers, and he's revoking bail because, and sorry, and allowing an anonymous jury because of Jimmy De Palma's murder. So it's clearly anyone associated with Mosca is going to be killed. So an anonymous jury, and I'm revoking bail, arrest. Mosca right now and lock him up. Mosca, extremely arrogant, also stands up and says, I want my veal dinner from Giuliani's or Giulini's or, or whatever. whatever it is. I want my TV. And I want my 35-inch big screen TV. That big screen TV? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so they, they revoked his, his bail and they're going to put him in prison. And that doesn't scare him because he's just going to order a big screen TV and a cannoli. <laughs> This is the. It's also does a weird jump here for Vice I haven't seen before because in the middle of the court scene, it suddenly just jumps to another day, and you only know it's another day because people are wearing different clothes. There's no like soft transition that you know something happened. This is Dick Wolf working out, realizing that in between these scenes, he needs dun dun. To show that the next day has happened. <laughs> dun, dun, and, then, like, and the description of where they're at. <laughs> what makes I always it even more confusing? That. <laughs> what makes it even more confusing is that it's still snack time because he <laughs> he whips some some kind of treat across the courtroom to one of his boys, probably someone named Polly or something. <laughs> Another Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> All that happens here is that the lawyers are arguing that Mosca is a creep and that he's a traditional mobster. But Melissa, let's start something here for, for this episode. Let's look to the scoreboard. Let's look up to the scoreboard. Number of words spoken. Tubbs is at zero. That would be a whopping zero. He has said nothing. He did in the background play catch with the sun. But nothing was said between them. <laughs> <laughs> I love this next scene because they go through this elaborate plan of how they're going to keep the jurors from being tampered with. So they're like, on Tuesday, they'll take the third van. And on Wednesday, they'll take the train. On <laughs> Sunday, they're going to travel by boat. And then back. So, but we'll split them into two groups. <laughs> Stan really lays it out here on like how much work to protect the jury. And real fast, you see that one of Mosca's men has a court drawing of what one of them looks like is following one of them already. So come on, Stan. Come on. <laughs> that should just be what we say for Stan all the time. Come on, Stan. <laughs> Get your head in the game. <laughs> now pause for an infomercial as the defense lawyers on TV talking about if you've been injured in an auto accident, call 1-800-JUSTICE-NOW. <laughs> <laughs> in a surprise twist when we head over to the prison mosca is having his five-star meal with a full bar in his reclining chair talking to his guard exactly what he said he was going to get what the hell is going on at miami dade county lockup that's what you're going to say this whole entire know, episode but, <laughs> i don't know but if this pork chop is dry heads are gonna roll <laughs> <laughs> at Alice's office, Alice and Sonny are talking to Ferugi. Ferugi? Ferugi? I don't know. It's the person yeah, Ferugi? I thought it was Mr. Perucci. <laughs> <laughs> All I know about Perugi is that he's just, he's just trying to run a bakery here, guys. <laughs> I need to lay off him. <laughs> he should stop making those dry cannolis and <laughs> no one wants them. <laughs> This was the person that Jimmy De Palma mentioned at the beginning of the episode that he had heard was in trouble, like what may be rat. But Barugi here is like, hey, I'm not testifying. I don't know what you're talking about. I got a loan from him years ago. I've been paying him back. I, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not testifying anymore. Sonny gets really mad. Alice is like, look, this is just the way this goes, like dealing with the mob. Like they're going to uh, muscle and intimidate everyone. Then we're just going to keep losing witnesses left and right. And she goes to her scoreboard. And crosses off another name of like of the 10, seven of them are already crossed off. We go back to the courthouse. Someone's testifying 
And this is this is the best scene of the episode. Mosca's mm-hmm. lawyer is asking him if he's ever met Mosca. And at the same time, in walks our muscle-bound bodyguard with his sunglasses on and a sleeveless t-shirt. And he just walks up to the bar that separates the crowd from the lawyers and just leans over with his muscles <laughs> yeah. like flexed out over the top of it. <laughs> I'm I'm a hundred percent sure you can't do that in a court. First of all, I know you can't even get up and like walk around and like go up to the people. You're not allowed to do that. Uh, second of all, I know you have to have there's like there's court attire that you're supposed to wear and a sleeveless tank top is not one of them. Court. <laughs> hey, so first of all, court attire, you're talking uh Sonny Crockett has been wearing a white suit with a salmon shirt this whole time. Oh um, yes, but that's a suit. A suit, not a tank top. <laughs> Barely a suit. It's a suit in the same terms that Saturday Night, John Travolta and Saturday Night Fever was wearing a suit. <laughs> My favorite part of the scene is the guy testifying because he is literally like, Eyes has no idea who this man is. <laughs> don't kill me, Frank. Please don't kill me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Under Alice's cross examination, after he says, no, I don't know, no, Frank Mosca. All I've done is just move some papers with his name on it. He identifies an envelope that has Mosca's like stamp <laughs> on it. And then she hands it to Mosca's lawyer, who, who then the hands em- yeah. it to Mosca. Mosca drops it, picks up a fake one. They hand it back to Alice and it starts smoking. And now, Melissa, let's go to the t- tub scoreboard. Tubs is smoking now. Two words. Get <laughs> down. Out. No, he said, get down. <laughs> he tackles get Alice. A glitter bomb. Flash mob. Yeah. <laughs> Mosca's lawyer is really upset that this happened, but Mosca seems very happy with himself. Yes, he is. He's very happy. <laughs> you would think that the judge at this point would say, okay, Mosca's not allowed in the courtroom anymore. And no crowd anymore either, because we just had a bomb go off. Even if it was a glitter bomb, we had a <laughs> bomb go off in my courthouse. At the county jail, the right-hand man to Mosca brings in another man. He's an ex-police officer named Krimmer. And he tells this story about knowing... L- L- little Jimmy Krimmer. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's Jimmy. <laughs> No, not that guy. The other Jimmy. <laughs> Jimmy's just trying to get an extra meatball at dinner tonight. <laughs> yeah, he's he's really a suck up. <laughs> Krimmer is saying that when he was working at County Lockup, he doesn't work there anymore. But when he did, he remember hearing about a man named Rivers who was being followed by a police officer and then ended up snitching to get out of serving time. And then suddenly the police Detective. officer wasn't tailing him anymore mosca says hey that's great thanks i'm gonna take care of you i promise you okay now get lost i gotta talk to someone not trying to be rude but get the hell out of here now (laughs) he tells his maybe he had to poop (laughs) (laughs) he tells his right hand man like don't put a head on him yet i have another idea we go to the courthouse and this is when sunny is testifying he's testifying that mosca is being a loan shark and under cross-examination from Mosca's lawyer is able to work out, like, well, that means that instead of taking down the hookers in Miami... He, we never do that. No, you I'm were working this one <laughs> area because you knew Frank was going to be there. Why did you... How did you know that? And he finally asked the cave and says it was an informant. Now, in the history of Vice, do we know them as prosecuting hookers? Crockett nope. seems to know lots of their names. Like, maybe more they entertain hookers. <laughs> Well, hey, for, for his credit, he even said Vice loves their hookers. So, yep, hookers and he, yeah, he, he, hookers and pimps. He didn't specifically say they arrest hookers, just that they love hookers at Vice. <laughs> they have Sonny back to in a corner now. They want to know who his informant is, and this is what Moscow was thinking that they will get the detective working the case, Sonny, to give up who the informant is, then they'll just go kill that one person. But Sonny does what he's supposed to do and uh-huh. doesn't name it and is held in contempt of court and locked up in Miami-Dade County Correctional Facility. Which means he's unable to protect the witness because he's locked up. But what's great is, is that Sonny's held in contempt, but he's not the one that flips out and, and starts yelling about how the whole court is out of order. <laughs> yeah, um. I know. I don't know what the hell is going on with that. <laughs> Dramatics. 
<laughs> Later, out at Jack's, Tubbs shows up and talks to Jack's son, Terry, who says that a bunch of people came and took his dad, and they don't know where he took him. He didn't know who they were. All he knows is that his dad's gone, and he doesn't know why. And he's asking Tubbs, why, what's going on with my dad? And Tubbs says, why don't you go stay at someone else's house? Okay, this is where I got irritated with Tubbs because, like, he's supposed to be protecting him, right? First of all, he's like, do you know who took mm-hmm. him? Like, you don't even care. Like, who <laughs> took him? I don't know. Also, like, how is he going to be protected at some other kid's house? Like, oh, go stay with some kid I don't know, you know, whatever. Like, how do you know he's protected? Yeah, should Take they put him, him with in you. witness protection or something? Take him in the damn car with you and drive away, <laughs> and then you know where he's at. Because <laughs> it turns out at the end of the episode, why was he no has one watching Im- him to begin with? I know. That's exactly it. So Crockett's locked up. Why? Where was Tubbs when he got taken? He was Tubbs. not talking. That's where he was. <laughs> <laughs> Tubbs, the beard. It's distracting him. He's like at home trimming it up and like making it sure it's all tight, clean. Did it bother you guys in the last scene when the lawyers approached the bench and it looked like they were standing on a ladder talking to the judge? <laughs> <laughs> Just it, it looked like the judge was like on his knees or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he looked really short sitting down, yeah. So there's no protection at Jack's house. And then after he gets taken, they continue to not give Terry, Jack's son, any protection. Tubbs goes out to the caddy and he gets a call from Trudy who says that County picked up Jack for possession with intent to sell. And they're locking him up inside a County. And Tubbs like, this guy's not a dealer. There's, this is not him. This is a setup. We need to go talk to Judge and Alice and get him sprung right now because th- this is a setup. For what it's worth, they See, did act rather quickly. this is what bothers quickly. me. Yeah, well, they acted rather quickly to drive over to the judge's house and get him to sign a lease order. But I am confused at why the DA couldn't put the witness into custody before that. They, they have that kind of pull. I've seen Law and Order. <laughs> I think it's because he didn't want to go into protective custody. Like, because he'd have to... I don't know. I think that's what that was supposed to mean. Like, he wanted to be out there with his son. I'm not sure, because based on his face at this next scene when he's <laughs> he in look- county, he is not happy to be there. <laughs> no, he's not. So he should have taken the protective yeah. custody. Well, because I think he's trying to hide all this stuff from his no, kids. No, I'm saying, I'm saying, when you're ill, if if the DA would have called the jail and said, "Hey, that's my witness, move him into a uh, solitary," then they would have moved him in solitary. But they, but they you were know? all in on it, though. All those guards were in on it. Like the guard that's like, "Hey, I don't know, you don't get your call." The guard that took him in, they were all in on it. That so, like, he wasn't going to get protective custody. That, that, that's a good point. I mean, the same guards that brought a big screen in and are feeding this guy. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Like, because so. when they bring him in, they're like. Hey, he's like, hey, I get a call. He's like, oh, I'm sorry. I don't know what you're talking about. You don't get a call. And like, whatever, go to your <laughs> cell. So they're all like, everyone's getting paid by Moscow, which is I, I why he's got a big screen you. TV. Sign the clipboard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, I can't hear you. Sign the clipboard. Yeah. <laughs> I have a problem with that window, too. How come it's not tall enough for either of them? I don't Both know. Both of them have to bend down. <laughs> I think he's supposed to be sitting down in there. So it's like the yeah, guy. But but the other person who walks in, like, the window's just too short. Well, I mean, you're a prisoner. They don't care if you have a bend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. So I, I think we've talked enough. Tubbs screwing up watching the witness. Now let's just talk about how strangely ironic it is. That all of the vice members get to the jail at, at the perfect time to witness the murder. Croc is in his cell. He hears from Mickey that, "Hey, you're here on the right day. Someone's gonna get lit up tonight about uh, for snitching on Mosca." Out in the waiting room, Tubbs and Alice are there. Like, "Hey, what's the delay here for?" And they're all there just in time to see one of the guards who walks J- Jack past Crockett's cell for him to say goodbye and then stabs him to death and carries his body up. But none of the other guards inside of the facility see it happening. They're all like reading newspapers instead of looking at the cameras. Yeah, it was like an inmate yes. and then the guard together that worked together. Yeah, and mind you, um, even though it was on camera, oh, Miami-Dade prison personnel were arrested at any point in this episode. They do mention really briefly in the second to last scene, I think, where they arrested that guard. Just that one. The one that stabbed him. I gotcha. So they got one of them. <laughs> just they just got the murderer. murderer. It's just that he doesn't... I don't think he stabs him. I think what happens is the guard like walks him over to a prisoner and the prisoner stabs him. And he just watches and then he pulls his body mm. away. Because remember, he's like lifted up. When you see him through the mirror... Or he croc can see him. He's like lifted off the ground from behind. Someone's holding him up. Mm -hmm. So maybe they're holding him up and the guard was stabbing him. But either way, it was an inmate and him. And they say both those people got what like got charged. All I know is that the subtitle said stabbing flesh sound. (laughs) Yeah, because it was like gurgling. (laughs) 
So now Cro- there's no reason for Crockett to be in jail. His informant he's protecting is now dead. So he's released. Their main informant, their only way that they can prosecute Mosca in this case is now dead too. So Crockett goes and pays a visit to Terry. And Terry's not happy to see him. Per what se. do you blame him? <laughs> <laughs> Even after his dad gave that whole speech about how you should trust Sonny Crockett. And... Well, I mean, it's not really Sonny's fault, but yeah, I think you're going to blame him. <laughs> Be fair, it, unless it was Sonny's fault, and it, you know, it wasn't, but, you know, it kind of <laughs> was. So. <laughs> It's been rough for Crockett since Larry died. Since Larry died, it's Criminals 3, Sunny Zero. <laughs> <laughs> but Terry obviously really wants to bring down Mosca. So he goes in, gets a box, carries it out to Sunny and says, my dad said to give this to you in case anything ever happened. And inside of it is every piece of paper that transcribes every deal mosca had ever done which just seems a little like I mean, mosca wouldn't let that happen but i don't know <laughs> well, why, why didn't he give him it to begin with then he definitely wouldn't have had to testify <laughs> yes good point good point <laughs> it's almost like he knew vice wasn't going to protect him and that he needed to stash something aside to keep his kids safe well, also, maybe he knew that, that Moscow would know that he was the only one that would have those books. So, like, if he if he didn't testify and he gave that information over anyway, he was dead anyway. Let's face it. He was dead anyway, okay? It <laughs> matter if, if he survived him testifying, he was going to die later on. I'm sorry, but, you know, maybe you shouldn't be a criminal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have this evidence. There's no possible way. That yeah. Frank is going to get off. He is going to be punished for murdering this kid's father. We're going to get a win, guys. We finally got one. Sonny is talking to Alice and Tubbs. They got a slam dunk here. They got all the evidence that they need. They go in and talk to the judge. The judge immediately says, yes, I have to allow this evidence. Uh, there's no reason to block this. And then some random person comes walking up and delivers an envelope to Alice, who she then reads it and says, I need total privacy in this courtroom. Remove the jury. And everyone, that way I can Everybody save else. us on this letter. <laughs> At the same time, Mosca gives like a what's up glance over to someone that's standing in the back of the courthouse too. And Alice reads the letter and it says that juror number seven has been paid for his vote. Because no one was watching the jury. <laughs> they go outside. Juror has a briefcase of money stashed in his trunk of his station wagon. And the juror's like, I don't know where this came from. I don't, I, this isn't mine. I don't know how this got here. Alice looks at Makes Sunny. no sense. They were supposed to come today by boat. <laughs> <laughs> Alice looks at Sonny says, I thought they were being monitored. And Sonny looks directly at Stan and said, they were apparently not good enough. Ouch. Come on, Stan. Come on, Stan. (laughs) Now, we've been down this road with Stan before. There was a hot dog to be eaten, okay? He could not pay attention. (laughs) He did that trick where he lost one of his fingers and he couldn't figure out how to get it back. It was just the whole (laughs) afternoon was a nightmare. (laughs) (laughs) we've been down this road with stan before where he has a hard time with surveillance (laughs) why do they keep letting him do it is the question i feel like maybe he's just better with paperwork or something no one has the heart to tell him because i'm telling you the only thing he's ever had good surveillance on is food those big giant hamburgers him and, when he noticed him that and clam Larry. shack yeah the clam shack <laughs> the one that the burgers him and Larry used yeah. to eat I mean come on oh yeah he's really good at making that type of stuff disappear <laughs> <laughs> So back inside the judge has to rule it's a mistrial uh, there's jury tampering wah, wah. he has to allow bail because of the time in between the when the state will then reapply for, for another trial like mistrial case calls for now i just remembered that when they showed stan when he was following that juror like earlier he was at the hot dog stand <laughs> 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 he was literally eating a hot dog and then he like saw me like surveilling him while eating a hot dog so i was right he really was a hot dog <laughs> Outside, Mosca oh. takes some questions from some reporters, and then when he goes to leave, Terry, Jack's son, pops out with a gun. Now, I'm thinking two thoughts here, because it takes forever. Telling Sonny, who's yes. trying to talk Terry down, just tackle him. 
Just tackle him. He's just a kid. Just tackle him. Sonny's trying to talk him down. He's trying to convince him that, hey, everything's going to be okay. He's going to raise him just like the son he's never had. <laughs> <laughs> Billy or Timmy or Bobby or somebody. <laughs> and that's exactly what Jack didn't know about <laughs> when he said Sonny will take care of you. He's a good friend. Like, no, if you knew his track record of taking care well, of children. He's a good friend. <laughs> he's not a good dad, okay? We've all established that. He's a really good friend. He is a terrible father. <laughs> This whole stuff means absolutely nothing because, as it turns out, the kid's a terrible shot. The whole time, Frank was never in any danger. <laughs> well, for the record, he shoots the air on hey. purpose. He can't be that bad of a shot. <laughs> but, hey, hey, it, look on the bright side. At least now the Vice Squad will get a conviction on someone. Someday. On Terry. For attempted murder. <laughs> on Terry. For firing a weapon in the air. Yep, for attempted murder. <laughs> yep, there goes all them scholarship offers. You're not playing football now. At least not unless it's for the Juvie League. Or maybe for the Florida Gators. I mean, that's where Sonny played. <laughs> uh, Gainesville can't say no. And after Terry fires and misses, we have a freeze frame. And that's the end of the episode. Except for, like I mentioned in the beginning, the couple new little clips added to the end credits of the show where we get some horsies. <laughs> horsies! <laughs> and I know we'll have more on this in our final thoughts, but I will say this is a solid start to season four, and it is a very different episode than we've ever seen in Miami Vice. This is the most we've ever seen in the courthouse. You combine all previous three seasons, we've never seen the courthouse this often, except for that one time with the basketball player who was the judge. Oh, yeah, because it was like a judge. And they were in yeah. that purple and silver courthouse yeah, designed by the... Prince. <laughs> yeah, that was a very weird yes. courthouse. <laughs> that would be courthouse number two, a.k.a. Purple Rain. <laughs> <laughs> Well, unfortunately, John, for as strong an episode this was to start off season four, I think we're also setting the precedent for what the music is going to be like in season four. So let's go talk about this week's music. All right, John, I don't want to give away any spoilers, but I know it's not the best music in, in a Vice episode. What do you got for us this week? Okay, so I start the season off on kind of a low note. Have you heard of the band Yellow? Vaguely yeah, sounds... Sounds familiar. Uh, like maybe I heard it from you one time. <laughs> maybe. Ah, <laughs> we might have talked about them last season, episode three, Kill Shot. <laughs> Today, <laughs> we will also be talking about them two more times. Don't worry if you don't know the band Yellow. You will. We, we, we have one <laughs> one song, and it's just by them. Yellows call it love. As a reminder, the band Yellow was originally founded in 1979 by Boris Blank and Carlos Perón. Carlos and Boris would start the band in 79, and they would add Dieter Meyer on vocals in 1980, which was a good move because in 83, Carlos would leave for an attempted solo career, leaving just Dieter and Boris as the band, the entire band. So they were a Swiss electronica techno pop band. They're a Swiss electro uh, electronica techno pop band. Because we're going to talk about them a couple more times, let's just talk about Dieter. Dieter Meyer was the uh, on, was on vocals, and he was also a performance artist as well as actually a myriad of other things that he would get into in into the nineties and two thousands. Let's start in seventy two. In nineteen seventy two. As part of an art display at a railway station in Kassel, Germany, Dieter would install a sign that read, that would read, On March 23rd, 1994, from 3 to 4 p.m., Dieter Meyer will stand on this plaque. And sure thing, 22 years later, he did. <laughs> Oh, I feel obligated. I have to do that now. Like, I have to make one. I just have to remember yes. exactly where I put it. <laughs> it just be, I just imagine sitting around one day, like, oh, no. It's almost 430. I was supposed to be somewhere. It's today. Can you imagine if you're at this railway station in Germany on March 23rd, 94? You're sitting next to this sign that says that. And then all of a sudden, this old guy comes running in and climbs up and stands on the plaque. I'd push him over <laughs> and stand on it. 
(laughs) (laughs) So, some more interesting facts about Dieter. In the 90s, Meyer continued his performance art and also designed silk scarves. He would also... Hey, if you're from Switzerland, scarves might be really uh, important to you. (laughs) Um, So, but he would also get involved with a company called Rewatch. Rewatch recycled cans and would turn them into watches. So he's got like a mellow gold watch or something. (laughs) I can just picture it now. That that name is a little on the nose. (laughs) So, uh, believe it or not, Yellow was still a band and actually still put out music through the 90s and into the 2000s, even though they didn't tour very much. After releasing two albums late in the 90s, Meyer bought 2,200 hectares land in Argentina. Yes, I said a hectare. (laughs) (laughs) This land, he would open a ranch called uh, uh, Ojo de Agua, which he would also use as the name of a restaurant and store that he would open in Zurich, where he actually currently lives. That store would sell wine, meat, corn, and soy-based products. I I get this feeling like this man is willing to do anything, including if he was to make a plaque inside of a train station yes. and go stand on it. <laughs> There's some fun, interesting facts about Dieter talking about yellow. We will talk maybe about Boris Blank next time. Carlos, maybe even Carlos. Um, <laughs> you know, it depends on if Boris is boring. I don't know if he stood on any plaques either. <laughs> and, and just in case you want to know why the band yellow was relevant, well, Well, their biggest hit, Oh Yeah, was featured in a number of movies and television shows, including Ferris Bueller's Day Off, the movie Something Wild, a South Park episode entitled Hell on Earth 2006. (laughs) So, there's your music. Excuse me, I have a plaque to make. (laughs) There was actually some more to this music segment than I was anticipating, because I saw yellow and I'm like, like, oh. Well, we had to talk about something. (laughs) Only and also that. only one song. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. As I mentioned, it's a, I, th- I think it's a strong start to season four, but I'm really interested to see what everyone else thinks. Let's go talk about our final thoughts here. <laughs> Melissa. <laughs> Coming to me. <laughs> why don't you start off our round table here, our final thoughts on this, the first episode of season four of Miami Vice. I was very excited to start the season and I was not disappointed. I like this episode. It paints Crockett in a better <laughs> light. No, <I'm> just kidding. <laughs> Except for his wardrobe. I'm unhappy with that. But <laughs> for once, he didn't screw it up. <laughs> no, I like it. And it's definitely going to be, uh, I think it's a good one because we've already talked about Stanley Tucci coming back and reprising the role. No, no, no. And I will not, say not that episode is a role. very good episode. Stanley was a distinctly different character than Stephen DeMarco in Baby Blues. No, no. I mean, he's coming back in oh, the future yeah, yeah. and reprising this role. By the way, what was the final score yes, on that I mean, whole he's in a future camp. episode in 20. Uh, <laughs> 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 like 30 words. No. Um, yeah. So he comes back and that is a really good episode. So I'm, I'm excited that that is to look forward to that because he's a smug jerk (laughs) in this episode. (laughs) So other than that, and other than the fact that there's a lot of courtroom antics that I do not believe for a second would take place in a real courtroom. I did like the episode. I wish that Stan would get his crap together (laughs) and pay attention and stop eating so many hot dogs. But, and I was a little disappointed that it was lacking in the women and Castillo, but I hope that that will not be the case for every episode. It was very Crockett heavy, which is fine with me, but I don't think it's going to be the case every episode this season. Yeah, I think there's a couple warning signs here for me. Those, now, I'll say this. I was anticipating, based on the lead up to season four, that I was anticipating this to be a not that great of an episode, but it was really good. And it was more courtroom drama than we've had ever in Miami Vice. When we got to the end, and what happened with the juror causing the mistrial with Terry. I was really like tense seeing not knowing what Terry was going to do. I thought for sure he was going to shoot and miss. And then they were going to have to either arrest him or that Terry was going to get killed. And then all the entire Rivers family would be dead because they mentioned earlier in the episode that you, his mom was dead. Too. You thought for sure the vice squad so was going to shoot the really kid. Sh- <laughs> but I thought this was a really good episode. I really liked it. But there's some warning signs here. One, lack of ladies in Castillo and Tubbs, even though they're 
there. They're not involved. Crockett, very heavy in this episode, but also it's that Law & Order feel where no one was really the main character. There was a bunch of people, but no one was really a main character. And I have a feeling that's going to continue throughout season four as we try and balance out the characters in the show. And I'm just nervous for what that is because obviously the duo plus Castillo have been so great up to this point. So I'm not sure how this is going to level out. So I'm kind of nervous about what's going to happen in the future. I did enjoy the serious storyline. There wasn't as much humor as we know will come in this season to try and Relax it a little bit, unless you consider Muscles McGee stalking the courtroom <laughs> to be humor. I did. <laughs> but I thought this was a good start to season four, but it has me nervous. John, what are your final thoughts? Man, Crockett's been on some bad luck. Ever since Larry died, every other episode, he's just getting kicked in the jimmy. <laughs> um, it, it, it's been rough, you know. And I really thought coming into season four, I was expecting kind of them to just kind of hit the ground running with like a just like a, a blowout episode, you know, with guest stars and music. And we were going to start the season off with a bang. And that's not exactly what we got. But it's not, it wasn't bad. It was, it was still good. It didn't have the music. It didn't really have the strong guest stars. We'd already seen Stanley Tucci in a previous episode. It wasn't what I was expecting, but it was still good. But it does make me a little worried of moving further in, into season four. Whether or not we're going to have the same type of guest stars showing up. How How is the music going to be this season? I really hope I'm not talking about yellow and band and simply red eight times this season. You know, <laughs> uh, I, I think the episode was, was a good vice episode, but I am ready to see Crockett get a win. And I'm really nervous about our guest stars and music going forward. Cross your fingers for me. <laughs> well, that's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode of go with the heat. We would love, love, love to, hear from you email us go with the heat at gmail.com tweet at us twitter.com slash go with the heat facebook.com slash go with the heat you can also support us on patreon patreon.com slash go with the heat we would love your support we're working hard on this show we have a lot of plans for the future so go check that out if you haven't had a chance to do so be sure to check out the website go with the heat.com click on support you can find all the other ways to support us including leaving a review on your podcatcher platform of choice or contacting us because we'd love to hear from you while you're there on that website you can also click on subscribe and find all the ways you can subscribe to the show google music itunes tune in youtube and i've been trying to get us on one of them smart speakers there i'm not gonna send any triggers but you know those little hockey puck things you got sitting in your kitchen. I'm working <laughs> on trying to get this thing to work there too. That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll see you all next time. Bye.